good afternoon welcome to Real Love Guitars. This is Sam here as usual and today we've got a Taylor Baby. Well that's just parts of a Taylor Baby. <coughs> Here's the other part. Just for the interest of those who haven't seen one of these before, they're a fantastic little guitar. Um, little Play, very highly playable travel acoustic <clears throat> but they have a, something that's unusual about them which is the neck to body joint instead of having a, a kind of heel attachment here it's got one surface attachment right, basically so there's the one point of connection um, and it fits the neck is attached with two large screws wood screws look like decking screws um, so it's a, it's a really simple attachment and it's really clever because it, it absolutely works um, and you can get under there fairly easy. It's very tight so you have to be very careful not to chip anything off as you remove it. But what you get under there is you get a factory installed shim to set the original, <coughs> original action of the guitar. So this one's marked up as a, a 16, uh, maybe it's probably a 16th of an inch. <laughs> And from what I can gather, I don't really know, but I'll just do a quick check out of my interest. For interest, I should say, is we get, well, according to this, I don't know how you work that out, but it's, well, that's a fraction, isn't it? So it's a 0 0.092 at that end and 0 0.077 at that end in terms of um, fractions, no, decimals of, a, of an inch. <coughs> But it's, I guess it's a sixteenth of an inch, but when they say that, it actually has a certain angle of slope in it. So when you put this in, it's a certain thickness, so it lifts the neck a certain amount up, but it also cants it up a certain amount. I'm careful how I say that uh, to reach a line with the saddle top. Um, so if you want to, if you have a, a, a Taylor baby Taylor neck that needs kind of resetting, as in the actions become completely unplayable, you can do it from in, in here. And if you know. If you know what the angle is of this and you want to make your own, it's entirely possible to get a piece of hardwood and uh, if you can cut it and precisely and thin enough, you can make your own shims. Or you can buy them from Taylor, apparently, although I couldn't find where to buy them. Um, but you'd have to work out what you wanted to do. So typically an action that's too high, maybe um, uh, the neck's there and the bridge is ra raised up, you kind of want, uh, you want to raise the you want to raise the whole thing or you want to tilt up the whole thing and raise the back a little bit or keep the original angle and just raise it up so you can you can work it out and put a order or make a shim to, to fit <clears throat> obviously they've got to be pretty precise but this comes with one already in um, on this guitar as well the neck uh, the you know, the saddle has loads of adjustment room anyway so we can you know if we want to right now if we want to do an, uh, an action adjustment we can do that via the saddle plenty of room to do that so here are my two very hopefully very strong wood screws. I'm slightly concerned that one of them feels a little bent to me. I could be wrong but anyway obviously that this guitar came to me for this reason which apparently is quite common. Um, I haven't had it happen to mine and I haven't seen it on any of the ones so far but it's a beautifully machined joint um, which apparently eventually comes loose the glue breaks down and the thing comes apart and you're left with two di two different bits. The truth is you can actually put it on and probably play it but you can take it off again when you want. Great for uh, travel, you know, get all of this into a little backpack but you really don't want to be doing that. Although I did imagine there could be a nice little interleaved, uh, you could make a, a titanium joint that did that but that would be quite fun. Anyway, so this guitar has come down to me for a neck fix and uh, a setup. And while, <clears throat> while I was looking at it over it, you know, it's had a, a fair old life. It's got a big chip out of the side there, which there's not really anything much we can fill it with. Um, maybe a bit of resin or something there, which will just kind of fill out the structure. Um, but I'm, I'm not really on the case for that. I'm on the case for um, fixing the neck first. And in doing so, I'm going to put some glue in there and, and hold that joint together under a bit of longitudinal pressure force. Um, I'm not sure quite how I'm going to clamp that. I'd probably use... Uh, a clamp down here and a bungee pulling at a certain angle that way. I'm going to leave that over the weekend clamped um, but then w when it comes to it I'm going to probably need to sand just the joins a little bit. I might get away with it, it might be absolutely clean. Um, 
but what I offered to the customer was that uh, you know it was entirely possible to um, give this a light coating or light dusting of um, matte lacquer. Um, actually, today is not a good day, but well, it would be a good day if I heated up the shed. Um, but we can we can give us a kind of refresh, and it cleans up really nicely. And there's a bit of stuff on here that we could give us a light sanding key, if you like, um, and then spray it with a very light dusting of matte lacquer, and it it does bring it back to a sort of original feel. Um, these get shiny when they get played a lot. That's the, the main thing. So, so the original matte lacquer becomes um, shiny with with kind of repeated use, and same with the neck. It becomes quite sticky actually on these tailors so you can either sand that back or you could um, put some lacquer on top as well just to if it's a mat you just get a, a bit of a better feel out of it so not overly complex um so first stage refix uh, redo the neck then we're going to keep the shim as is um we're going to put it back together again or spray it put it back together again and then make an adjustment um put some really ultra light strings on because this is going to go um to the customers, going to be the customer's seven-year-old who's going to learn to play on this. So the lighter and um, easier to play it is, the better. Um, but it's done some real service and it came in its bag this morning through the uh, parcel force delivery um, and it also had um, sand in there so it's proof that it's been traveling and been to the beach. This one, out of interest, this has got a stamp date of May 28th, 2007 and it's got a, a handwritten date of um, what appears to be something like the 4th of June uh, 07 oh that's written in kind of English style rather than um, uh, American so it's, I don't know, it's probably 9, nine or 4 oh, 06 oh, 07 uh, so it's manufactured on 28th this neck manufactured on 28th of June fitted and uh, shimmed and whatever on uh, about a week later 2007 so it's 10 years old and um, this is what happens so when you look up close at this it's quite interesting from my perspective because there's no real evidence of the previous glue so there must have been very very little room for there to fit any glue in there so um, combination of perhaps heat and cooling and heat and cooling has maybe degraded this glue over a period of time um, I've got one in house my own and uh, <clears throat> I don't see any sign of the joint separating but you can see it's going to be very very tight and as soon as I put any glue in there and put it under pressure the machining is so tight that there isn't a lot of room for that glue to make uh, a kind of longer term bond if you, or to, to pack it out if you get what I'm getting at. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to take these tuners off. Now when I come to respray this thing I'm, I'm not going to want to spray the front of the headstock um, I'd like to do all the wood parts and I'll cover the headstock and the um, bridge components um, and, and the spray job will be very very light um, but it's a uh, I've had a good result with it before using this particular um, I use believe it or not rust-oleum lacquer and it sits on top of this original stuff pretty well I've got uh, I've got a similar thing to do with my own actually it's <coughs> it's sort of worn the lacquer off the back here with it has gone some of the original stain as well so um, I, I could the, the challenge for mine is is whether or not just spraying it will reintroduce that color it's probably unlikely actually I, um, I posted a picture of this on my Facebook page this morning and it's quite it's quite odd handling um, the head a severed headstock and I, I, I kind of intentionally make it sound a bit macabre, macabre. because it is it feels it, do, it does feel you know, it, it makes me realize how much we feel guitars are like bodies you know there's something about this with the tunes on feels like somebody's hand after a bad road crash sorry to you know use a graphic image but it's a very odd thing um it doesn't feel right to see it in pieces so uh, it's um it's a very uh it feels very important to put it back together again um i'm looking forward to to the, to the doing it you know it's like a surgeon would feel about refitting somebody um you know what i mean fixing someone after a crash or a <coughs> some sort of injury anyway now i'm just putting a 
thingy around this. I don't know. I, I just like to know where things came from. That's from the front, okay? So I, you and I will remember that the uh, and the number goes to the front as well. So just in case the, the the diameter of the thread is different or something, I just want to know it goes back in the right one. What I can also do is I'll sort of put a little felt back in on these as well when the time comes, just giving that little extra padding against the wood. Okay, so this is the, the body kind of standing on its own. Um, I'll take this out for now. And basically, when I'm doing other things, when I, once I've clamped and glued this, I can do a little bit of gentle cleanup and then sand down this, tape this off. And um, actually, if I feel like it now, I could probably give it a couple of dusts of the old lacquer now and leave this set over the weekend. It's probably better I do that. I'm going to go and visit, um, visit my son over the weekend, leaving, um, leaving my stepson in charge of the, <laughs> the guitar shop. He won't be doing anything, but he'll just be there. He'll be the dopamine on site. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it'd be probably good to, to just leave this uh, any lacquer curing untouched for a couple of days, which is probably uh, a bit more than I usually kind of can do because often I'm you know, there's a, a turnaround time. I never get to leave things quite as long as I would really like to. This, by the way, is just um, I just get rid of some of the sort of surface grime. Um, if, if uh, in order to spray it, I would very lightly sand this and wipe it down again. But I'm just, I just want to make sure there's no kind of oils and greases on there. I found these, I found these degrade quite quickly. So sanding this and spraying this will actually be quite a good move because the the lacquer on here gets quite sticky quite quickly with human use, <clears throat> and it's very soft. And you can actually found in the past you can scrape it off with your fingernail at this stage in its life which is a you can feel it it's a very odd texture <clears throat> and it isn't just uh, I, I, to begin with I thought it was just like a layer of um, grease you know hand grease or, or cooking vapor like you get when you have a, a guitar um, you know hung up in the house or something you can you can get that uh, patina whatever they call it of, of grease or something but it, it's not it's uh, so it's the way that I don't want to do it because it's so easy to do it's the way the lacquer breaks down now I'll rub some of this back with <clears throat> with some um, paper and I'm just going to see if I can uh, clean this off I do have some scratch remover which is around here somewhere I took it in the house didn't I? I mean, there's a some sort of house paint that's got into here, and I can just see that it's it's just on the it's gone into the grain a little bit. So that's always going to be difficult to eke out without sort of getting a brush in there of some sort. Of, so it could be a could be a toothbrush actually with a bit of the old lacquer, uh, the old naphtha. But if we can't get it out, then I will live with it because it's not the it's not the most important thing. If this was a, a flat finish um, then this stuff comes off really well with the scratch remover but it's, it's the fact that it's in the sitting in the grain that makes it difficult in this case so we might not get it out I'll have a look with the scratch remover and if it doesn't and you're lucky then good but that's uh, that's the second part of the thing part part one is we can get onto this. Now this is a totally new one on me. As I said, I've not had one of these come apart before, so I don't know the, I don't know the, uh, I had that experience. What was interesting, I went and had a look online to see, just a, I like to do a sort of fact check to see if anyone else, I know uh, lots of people have done this repair before. Um, somebody on, on Facebook just mentioned to me that they've done exactly that. So. Uh, it's quite common um, and so I expected to find it pretty quickly on YouTube um, and I have to say I'm surprised that I didn't um, so I couldn't quickly find uh, you quickly find a video referencing this repair so um, some luthier or other in the world <coughs> might say oh no you you've got to do this with uh, some sort of two-pack resin 
or somebody will say, oh no, you've got to do it with wood glue. Um, so far in working with different woods, the reasons that I've used resin as a glue fixer, as opposed to um, so it's the tight bond stuff, <coughs> is the tight bond is water uh, based, is that the right word? Yeah, water based. Um, and some woods that, like for example, I glued this Eki guitar that I told you that I'd been making with, um, glued that with, or stuck that together with, uh, actually what I used was Gorilla Glue. And I used Gorilla Glue because uh, it was, it's, what's the word, not water resistant. Yeah, it's, it's not water based. So I have a choice, um, in a sense, anything that will stick this together will work. Um, and I'm by no means a sort of expert on glues or which you know, technical properties of glues. What I, all I know is that we've got a very tight, machined, precise joint. Um, and presumably, and I could be guessing at this, but presumably one of the reasons why this has failed in the past, oh, no, I presume, I'm making the assumption that it's partly because you can't really get much glue into there at all. So how do you get something to grip if there's hardly any room for the glue? Now, a couple of things one could do. Um, the first thing that strikes me is if you're going to put it in here and you want to glue it, if not, there not being enough room for um, the thing to be glued in the first place is an issue, um, then what we might do is to get, let's have a think, let us get a 32 thing, 32 thing. Now what I'm thinking of doing is why don't I put some sandpaper on there and just make it my business to just dust off whatever, first of all I don't want residual old glue, it's no good to me. I can, I can you know, look using my sort of day-to-day -day common sense, old glue in there is just going to be a hindrance and if anything it's going to prevent me getting a good fix so let's just see if i got a piece of 220 grit from uh g and w woods in portugal let's say i got this and i were to stick this to my 32 now Truth is, do I need it on all of this? No. What am I going to do? Let's put it on half of it because then I can still carry on using this thing. Let's get a blade, please. Oh, do you know what? I lose every single blade. Every blade I've ever come across. So I'm going to cut this and use a bit of it. I don't need much length. So I'm going to take this and obviously cut it. I could do both sides, couldn't I? That would be mighty clever. Let's try that if I've got enough. Take off the backing. Try and take off the backing. Anyway, um, I just had Mark come over and pick up his uh, Les Paul, Gibson Les Paul, I'm very happy with it, and also his Epiphone. So I'm going to use this much of this end, well in fact I'm going to use as much as I can get away with. I'm going to cut that there, put that there. I'm going to slice along here, tidy it up. And fold that over there, like that. Cut along the other edge, for being a perfectionist's sake. Yes, he's uh, very nice. Spent a nice um, hour chatting guitars and life and un life, the universe, and everything. You know, it's really nice. It's one of the best things about doing this work is how many great people I get to meet and, and hang out with often, and and also play with often. So there we have a little homemade file for the purposes and the purposes being very carefully uh, just I want to just I suppose the word might be key up the surfaces in here okay and why am I doing it I think I'm doing it because I want to remove the old uh, wood glue and I'm going to put it on here so I've got a nice flat kind of grip on it. So I just want to clean up the old glue as much as I can. I can see it's it's uh, it's obviously some stuck there. Not a lot, but a little bit. 
So I'm not putting loads of force into it. I'm just kind of I'm, I'm starting by, if nothing else, keying up the surface. That's my kind of my first aim. And then while I'm at it, I'm saying to myself, OK, if there's excess um, glue, uh, if, it, you know, if there's excess glue on here, we'll take that away possibly as well. Um, but kind of first and foremost, it's to rough up the surface. Now that looked like it's OK. Now that doesn't go all the way through because there's a little there's a little uh, stuck spur, bone spur, no, wood spur, a bit of wood that's come off the other side of the joint. So I can't really get to that. But and I can do the same on this. And just, just no, no real brute force or anything. Just light enough to dust it up. And then what I'll do is I'll give it a spray through with air. Um, get as much of the dust out as possible. And then I'll know that I'll have basically keyed up the surfaces a bit and also given myself a micron or two more space to work in. Um, because if we didn't get enough glue in there the first time, then this time we can hopefully get a little bit more in to achieve our stickiness. Okay, so I'm going to zap some air through here. Lovely. Now, <clears throat> the next thing, that's good fun, keep that for another day. It's a useful little uh, tweak. i remember it's there. <clears throat> the next thing to do is to think, okay, how are we going to do this fix? Now, we have got a couple of options, right? We've got an angle that needs to be kind of respected. We can either start with the headstock down here and this um, pulled backwards, okay? So with some sort of loading to bring this headstock back. Now we don't want it to pull it up at the same time. We just want to pull it backwards towards the end. So we equally we could place that, although it doesn't fit flat on the ground, we could have that near flat and this one pulled at an angle towards it, towards the ground. It feels like having a solid base with this one pulling is probably a better option. And we could make a little, uh, we've got a wedge here. I'll do this on a board, obviously not on the carpet. We've got a little wedge here that can um, kind of keep the angle right as well. Or just, just prop it up so it's acting as a nice stopper. So once we've got the, the supported and the angle supported, really all we have to be able to do is to pull the two ends close to each other. Now I do have some um, some long clamps. I'm not really sure if that's what I want to use for this because in a sense it will be sort of pulling backwards a bit. Let's have a feel. Let's have a feel. I'm not going to put any major pressure on it. Now that's going to pull it together. Let's have a look at the angle. Oops. One of the things I know about this is it could do with a bit of WD-40 wherever that went. Um, what did I do with the WD-40? This is electrical cleaner. WD-40 has gone for a walk. Hmm. I think, oh, do you know what? I think I ran out. In fact, I didn't know I ran out. I didn't think I ran out. I know I ran out. So I'm going to need to put a bit of grease of some sort onto this thing because it's a little bit stiff. So there's a little bit of a diversion thing here. but. There's no reason why this shouldn't be a bit looser. I think it got left out in the rain uh, while working the other day, so it's, it's got a bit stiffened up. So, grease is the word, is the word. Okay, through. I was watching, um, watching some of the video on oiling, <coughs> doing tongue oil on um, an oil finish on the body, guitar body. And uh, I was really surprised to hear somebody recommending putting wax. Oh, there was a, I was looking to see how you, how you put oil with a wax. 
finish on top and uh, somebody said suggested that um, once you've done the oil then you do the wax by heating up your cloth so that the wax is melted I just thought and then he said don't do it with a burner you'll set fire to the blah 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 and I thought well how do you heat a cloth up successfully really I mean really what you want is your wax to be kind of semi melted I just thought it seemed a bit of a silly approach to try and melt it heat a cloth up when you you really want soft wax anyway I don't know I haven't done it before so okay so I'm just looking at the the feel there that's actually just feeling this that's actually not a bad kind of outcome it, it's pulling it together enough again we don't want to over over tighten it because we don't want any bit of possible glue squeezing out all over the place um, so I think this clamp with that prop will be enough when the time comes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just push a few things around. <coughs> I'm going to get me my this is a very trusty oak plank. This is this has been a flat edge or flat surface for many a, a job. Now I'm, if I'm going to clamp this a little bit, I don't want to clamp straight onto the fret faces, um, but I don't really. And I also don't. Do I? Don't I? Hang on a sec. I'm thinking out loud. I forgot what the radius is of this guitar because what I could do is I could support that like that but then we lose the that would be that's wood by the way it's not sandpaper that's kind of a nice support but then we lose the, the potential of using that wedge as a, a double prop so I'm going to do we need much of a clamp do we need much of a clamp we need a clamp in so far as we just want to hold the uh, neck reasonably firmly we don't need to sort of squash it flat or do any such thing so what I think is we could use a couple of bits of this soft cleaning cloth first of all just as a provider surface for this to sit on all right so it's not kind of wood against metal against hardwood what's that now <laughs> why is this so difficult it's curled up because I cut it wrong. Let's, let's just do it in single sheets. I'll use more rather than less. Because otherwise I'm just going to be working with folded over bits and it's going to get in the way. So the only way to do it is to use some... Lucky I cut lots of bits, isn't it? Let's use, let's use three of those. Give us a, a soft footfall for our thing. Now, if I were to clamp that, I'm only clamping it down for the sake of holding it in place. I don't really want to do any more than that. Is that long enough on this thing? The joint's there, clamp there. Um, I do want it face down. Maybe I'll put another piece of soft stuff down first. Yes, so these are just, I'm going to use these for my oiling shortly. So this is a, a quite a flat radius, so it's not going to put too much stress on the frets this way. Um, now I can either I could either do the that's a bit I prefer the cork thing um, and I want to hold it down but I don't want it too close to that end so if I'm going to do this I'm, sure I'm going to end up what's going to happen if I'm not careful I'm going to end up doing this to the bench and then I can't do anything else so what I really want to do is get that done first so I can move it around and it's not one of those. clips from here from that. So let's come to here. I'm trying to just make a, 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 rem, a movable thingamy jig that I can sort of take around a bit later on and it'll sort of stand alone on the floor somewhere out of the way so I don't have to worry too much. And also I can get on with the other bits like the spraying and whatnot. Okay. So Okay, so that's um, get the right button, get tightened up. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, my my neck is sitting comfortably on there. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, I can lean it. Well, I can prop it up somehow for a minute. Just want something to prop it up. Okay, that's that'll do for now. It's just a 
a means to an end. So what I'm going to end up doing, obviously, as you can see, is I'm going to put glue into these joints, faces, or into one face. It's probably better to just load this face and, and uh, join it up like that. But I'll try and get it on as much as possible. Then I'm going to put it on, and it's going to go everywhere. Now, if I do it this way, the thing I'm not going to be able to do is get to the front and wipe off the glue, and I'm going to get some glue 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 into the nut channel so if I take these off for a minute put them, just prop them tidily out of the way not I know where everything is so let's do the let's do the prep and gluing separately but I kind of know what I'm doing I'm going to then put that on there I'm going to clamp it into place and I'm going to put the two bits together clean up the spill and do something and something and something and then something and a bit of something. Note to self, buy more wood glue. So did I decide, is this wood particularly oily? No, it's mahogany. Is it particularly oily? It's probably oilier than something else, but I don't think it's exceptionally high or is it is it is mahogany a glue that you wouldn't glue with type bond? Not that I've heard. So Rather than use Gorilla Glue, which spills a lot of expansion out, I'm going to use Tight Bond because it's supposed to be the general all-purpose glue, as you might say in South Wales. And I'm not saying that because I'm a, an anti-South Wales racist. I'm saying it because I lived in South Wales and I love the way people in South Wales say the words like glue. Um, in fact, that's where I'm going tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it was a I lived between Cardiff and Newport, and to this day I still miss the accent. So, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to load these joints, and then I'm going to put them together, and I'm going to expect a whole load of spill, right? And I don't mind how much I load, okay? And I don't, much, don't, don't mind how much I'm going to spill either, because it's all going to come out and go where it belongs. But I want it on the surfaces as much as anywhere else. I don't particularly want it down the bottom of the channel surfaces more than not. So I'm not afraid of getting it on the lacquer either because that's going to get either dusted down and sprayed. And this is a face as well for the joint. And we're leaving the nut out of this arrangement for now. We'll do the nut later as part of the setup process. So here's one side of the deal. a cat or a bird on the roof right the second. Now this may be overkill in terms of glue quantity but um, I just I don't mind having more to begin with than is required so that I can I can always choose to clean up spills and excess and the, the gentle clamping will force out excess glue there's no doubt about it we'll we will rid ourselves of anything the joint doesn't need kind of automatically we don't really have to worry too much. Um, but hopefully there'll be enough to keep this thing together. Now that bit at the top there is the nut slot itself, which we don't want to do. So, like I said, what's going to happen is if I put these together, first of all... Welcome back. See the jute glue, jute glue, glue, glue... will squirt out everywhere. And what I haven't, of course, done is prepared myself with a piece of kitchen towel. One for stuff to fall onto, like that. And the other one to mop up whatever comes off. So I think by the time I get around to um, thingying this slot um, or putting this, clamping this, I don't think I'm going to avoid having spill out. It's going to spill out whatever happens. But I can, I can sort of take off the bulk of it right now. Um, still, I'm still sort of half and half at the moment. It's loose, everything's loose. I'm not committed to anything yet. So I'm going to place this on here, I'm going to place that on here, and I'm going to go back now and a bit of calm luck. While everything's still loose, I'm going to reattach my, my clamps to hold things in place. Come on, you. Thank you. Second so clamp. This is my, my jig in place eventually okay all right and then i'm going to get my bowl under there 
to prop me up. Now I'm going to get my wedge under there to lift the headstock to where I want it to be, which is pretty much that, as close to that as I can get. And then, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to feel this joint with my fingers because what I want really to make sure is that it's kind of equidistant. There's no sticky up bit so it doesn't need to woggle from side to side anywhere. Okay, and that, I think that's going to be as good as it can be if I have to do any sort of sanding afterwards. Now I've just created myself an interesting problem. As you can just see, I haven't left myself a way of <laughs> clamping. Okay, so what we know is the end-to-end -end clamp is probably more important right this second than the down clamp and I'll have to worry about that in a minute. So you see my fabulous plan is already not, is already not working out. Don't worry, I will get another kind of clamp out, but let's, let's get the important clamping taken care of first. All right, we'll go dead on the center if we can. If we can, come on. Thank you, dead on the center. Okay, now that's starting to put a little bit of pressure on. That's nice. And the glue you can see coming out. And I'm going to, whoops, knock it over. Clear up some more excess from the joint. And it's a good opportunity to look at it. Now I'm not going to worry about stuff spilling out at the bottom because what I can do is I can always clean it with a knife afterwards. Now, having done this, and I could do this now to hold this in place, which is cool, but I have to find uh, a clamp that will sort of allow me to do that. Um, what have I got that will allow me to do that? Probably got something called fire. Where might it be? It might be this one. Of course, the nice thing about this is that there's a sort of, there's a degree of slowness about it, which we can take advantage of. So I need to bring that together with that one side or other of this bar. So if I just orientate, orient this off there, make sure it doesn't want to fall off anywhere. And let's just have a look. Where am I going to get to at best? Okay, I could go over the top of it, could I not? I could. And I could go down over the top of it, could I? Probably, maybe not enough to reach. No. Okay, so it's not going to work that way. So as you can see, I've got plenty of time to think this through on the fly. So I'm going to place this just next to that, like that, <laughs> and clamp downwards on here. And I guess the main thing is it's sort of attached Put it off, bit off balance, but it's attached the um, this piece to the floor. So I'm, I'm in the right sort of thing. Now I'm just having a look at the angle of this. Uh, it does have some movement in it, so bottom line is it's going to end up at whatever the, uh, the pull feels like is right, and that isn't correct at the moment. So I can see it; it's not quite right. So. This angle may well not be what I want to have happen. I need it to pull downwards, downwards and um, across woods at the same time. So I think I may have to employ another clamp. Uh, I'm going to use a smaller one, smallish one. So part of the deal is we've got to get this thing gently to resist it from uh, skidding upwards. Now I've got a massive great fly in here for some reason. Okay, so okay, so these two together, now we're going to get uh, an uphill pull and then a crosswoods pull at the same time. Holding it up still with my hand, which is okay. Okay, so 
so while I'm at it, I'm just going to keep this pressed down. I'm going to clear the excess glue, look at the condition of the joint. Don't mind it going to one side for a minute. Um, have a look at it now. If I'm at this point in the game, if I'm not 100% convinced that this is uh, pulling it to ultimately the right shape and I'm going to cancel it and remove it okay so it has to be on it's going to be you know far enough on to be on but it's not got to be raising up anyway it's got to be on nice and clean and the clean the cleanliness of the of the connection really is the combination of the longitudinal slightly upward pull and the downward pull but the, it's a sort of combination of three different forces Cross, upwards and downwards. Um, now looking at this, feeling this as I can, it feels very clean. Um, if I have some, do I have some water in here? Probably not all of a sudden. I do, but it's not the cleanest water in the world, but it will do. So I can just wipe off a little bit of this external glue. Room and then gives me a, a better sort of view on the joint. Okay, and so just a quick check if I do that, it comes up. That's out of sequence, so I do that, it goes back down. And I'm just trying to get an absolutely smooth join as possible between these. And if I get that smooth join, it'll kind of tell me that we're as well matched as possible. Because there is a degree of flexibility in the, uh, in the leaves of this joint, I guess that's what you'd call it. Okay, I'm just having a look. I wish you could see what I could see. So altogether, that is, I think, nearly and about as good as we're going to get. And this one, this one, I have to say, is a little bit on the loose side. I'm going to try and position it somewhere where I can be a bit more dependable with it. Down and in. Okay, so down and in. I want it to stay. It's sort of difficult because it moves. It's moving with the uh, the thing. Down and in. Combination of forces. Down and in. Down and in. The thing is, if once I've got it got it in the right position, then um, I can leave it, park it somewhere, and just not touch it but like I said before I'm going to, I want to be completely convinced that I'm in the best position for this joint I say, otherwise I would um, knock it on the head and rethink it it's not the, it's not the easiest angle to simulate really Contact all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, I don't know what word is. It's quite tricky.
this really is down to sort of touch uh, feel thing going on here now I mean I can feel the just about feel the the difference or the, the edges of the joint but it's almost impossible not to partly that's because there's some glue coming out the joint so I'm going to call it I'm going to get one bit more water and then I'm going to clean it up a bit more and then I'm going to call it call it done or placed for the time being um, I don't think there's any sideways or anything that needs to be done. I'm going to go and look at it in the light a minute. Hold on. Bright light of day. Glare of the afternoon. live with it and place it right there out of harm's way there you go Woo that's that bit done oh, I've got a huge fly in here okay so I've got a, the joint uh, glued I've got it at the right angle so that it fits snugly um, which isn't a particularly a measured angle. It's just a you, you know measured with your eyeball. Is there any gap? Is it creating? You know, if, it, if it's if it's out, you, you get a gap there. If it's the wrong way, you get a gap there. You've got to get it as close as you can where it's all snug and fit, and then you've got to get it that way to that way correctly. It appears to be done. So I'm going to go inside. All right, actually, I'm going to take this up. But after that, I'm going to go inside and get me some. What am I going to get? Scratch remover, see if I can get rid of that bit of white stuff before I um before I scuff up the uh, um the lacquer on the back the prior to the spray. I I could heat up this it'd be probably boiling, but I could heat up this um the shed a bit do it in here um, but it would be quite quite a difficult quite a, a hot afternoon um, the alternative is to see what we get tomorrow daytime I, can look, I could have a look at the weather forecast and see but I suspect it's not going to get much less humid um, what I would like is a flat edged thing come on that will do I'm looking to do is just to, to get my masking tape in there and then I can just very lightly cut along the edge of the join and it comes up like that. So I'm just uh, maybe I'll use a little cocktail stick. So I'm just um, basically just want to mask off the, uh, the bridge saddle or uh, the bridge and, and it, technically I didn't didn't really need to, I could just spray over the top of it, but I um, kind of like to leave it its original finish rather than add lacquer to it. you get a bit of warmth in an October day like this you get these late flies that come out I'm just you can see cutting away the excess so it doesn't take much to do I mean, it's not a major undertaking this. Um, as I said, I've done it before. 
before and found that it's you, know, you can very quickly refresh the guitar with a, a blast of matte lacquer which is um, I made a mistake on the previous one where I had had to replace the bridge it lifted and I had to replace the bridge and then, and then I got some of the masking tape caught under the new bridge join which was a bit of a pain because it, it was then very difficult to get out um, but uh, this won't be the same okay so there we have a bit of masked off bridge um, I would also fill the center with some tea towel or some such just to stop loads of dust lacquer dusting its way in there um, it's unlikely to get much in there but it's always quite a precaution and um, like I say actually this this uh, matte lacquer is pretty good in humidity conditions it doesn't for some reason it doesn't bloom uh, anywhere near as much as the clear nitro stuff does um, so it's probably it's more, than, more than possible that we could do it now I can do it with a I'll probably do the, the, the dusting the light dusting and keying with a thousand grit very 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 slight I just want to create um, take a bit of the glue off the top and create a, a sort of gripping surface so um, I'm just going to li literally kind of dull it off a little bit it ch it'll change the look because as it always will because at the moment it's um, starting out with hand grease on it you know, and uh, it's been rubbed smooth by years of playing so it's going to so it quickly clags up with surface glue but a little bit of a, a key up just to give it something to hold on to is a good idea and where I can't reach with the, the block then I'll go in with my manual sanding and I'm just keeping it in line with the grain because I don't want to, I don't want to swirl it um, so I'm just, just, just taking off the shine really and knowing that it's it's just keying up the uh, existing lacquer um, let me go and get the stuff back with you in a second hello we are here with Jim's thingy uh, well, something's bleeping something's phoning me or something well fine hopefully it doesn't pick up on the camera too much anyway okay so you know I did a small spraying of this little fella so what I've got on here is some uh, some sticky stuff which is holding this string on so I'm just gonna gently remove the masking tape and the other stuff so we've joined the rejoined the neck and sprayed it and it's had the weekend uh, to cure fix whatever the word might be so the job today is basically to reassemble this guitar put a new nut on it and in doing so uh, put put the uh, well check first of all I'll check the check and set the action um, and then then put uh, maybe reduce the saddle a little bit and then once that's done I'll put some new strings on it and the strings I've chosen for this are ultra light because Jim wants to use this or well, it's a seven year old daughter I think to use this guitar or to learn on this guitar so very light strings are good um, it's also light anyway it's light to play at, at the best of times because it's a shorter scale slightly shorter scale guitar um, so you get that sort of advantage of it anyway so you could you could get away with sort of 10s or 12s so you could get away with 12s and it would still feel it still feels light to play lighter than the standard excuse me okay so this is my um, I've got oil on here so I've just gone and done that's okay since I finished spraying it but is it done it's on a piece of something got oil on something okay. just wipe it off right. um, poke out my little divots of paper 
and I've just got a slight bit of cleaning off there to do what I'll, I'll do it with. See, it's not that um, at all. I was going to say I'll do it with a bit of uh, lack. No, you know, solvent, naphtha, but actually doesn't need it. So there's me little bits of filler to protect oh, the tuning plug holes things. Okay, so we have the guitar. So close up neck rejoined and it's got some dents and holes in it anyway so I'm not I've not tried to fix those or change those I've kind of left them in place um, little little scratches and bits and bobs so it's not absolutely perfect but it's better than it was and I've taken away some of that sticky goo and the idea now will be to replace this in here now it may have picked up a tiny bit more or tiny bit of um, lacquer so I'm just going to be ready to gently sand down the edge down the edge you know what I mean down this bit here so that so I just check where it goes to yeah because we can afford to just keep this thinned down as possible because we don't want it to jam up the joint basically just taking any obvious sort of excess of uh, lacquer that's going to get in the way. So we've got our two screws to put back together. Okay, you can feel it goes in as snug as anything. i just got to sort of line it up to ensure it goes in, which is sort of like there. It's very tight. We've got, to, um, we've got to sort of wiggle it in. This might benefit from a tiny bit more of the sanding. Just see how it stretches to. This uh, sits just above the line so we can take a little bit more off here. They're very, very, very snug to begin with these uh, Taylor babies, the neck fit, which is great, that's what you want, but it does make um, refitting them tight, snug. Make sure there's nothing stuck in here that's getting in the way. I mean, you could just as easily do a little bit of Sanding, just to make sure there's no nothing caught in there since we took it apart. Okay, so it's a matter of lining it up. I want to get it right to the back of the pocket, and then you can push to push to the front. And if you've got it right, you should. No, it's too too far. Push to the back. Push to the front. And obviously, you have to do this with. down on there so if it's not going in straight away then we've got just a little bit more I'll take off here and do it as precisely as possible going up to this line on both in both cases so it, did, it shows the difference in the thickness of the lacquer that I sprayed on basically um, to, to rejuvenate dip a little bit and you can see the, the end of the line where it meets the body. Yeah. Reducing the thickness that way, little bit by little bit, instead of trying to do it by adjusting anything on there, we don't want to do it. Because the, thick, the additional thickness is purely lacquer from the, the sort of refresh. And they were, they are very uh, tight to begin with. because of the, the, um, the curve on the body obviously we don't want to um, so it's 
just gripping a little bit on the lacquer here, so technically speaking, I could probably do a tiny bit more, a tiny bit more sanding. Go right up more close to the edge carefully. So anyway, what I'm going to do, once this is done, I'm going to, um, I'm going to set the height of the, or I can put a couple of test strings on, um, which I'll find from somewhere, and then we'll basically adjust the saddle to where we want it to be. Okay, we're going to get there. Still quite stiff. Sort of limited amount of force onto this bits. Uh, probably a little bit more still. You can see it sort of build up right just at the end here. So I'll just take this bit back a tiny bit. Yeah, so we'll we'll set the uh, an ideal height, which I won't make too low, but I also won't make too high. So about 2.5 millimeters, something like that, and we'll go for a nice, uh, a nice low first fret action. Um, I had a, a you know a few comments or a couple of comments on a video just the other day, talking about how. The actions that I was setting were way too low for some people, um, but clearly they're not too low for some other people, so um, it's a preference thing. Okay, this thing should go right up to right up to the mark, which it isn't quite yet. So this is going to sit right down to the line, so I can I can make sure I sand a little bit to the line. Let me see what that's saying. Yes, 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 everything's fine. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, you know, the issue of playing action is, of course, it's, it's personal. Um, and I suppose, you know, the only thing about doing what I do is that the reason I do what I do is that uh, a lot of people in the past have wanted their action on their guitar set really low. So consequently, I, I wouldn't be setting for a high action and you know, some people quite rightly pointed out that um, for them that their objection to a low action is that they can't get bends out of you know if they're playing blues or something they can't get bends out of a very low action um, and that's that's true to a point except okay is that yeah, that's okay, that's rocking it over the edge there. Um, yeah, it's true up to a point, except uh, in, one, in many ways the thing about the way I set the playing action is that uh, it it can usually I can make a very low action play with the bends. Um, there are just there are a couple of notable exceptions. For example, I think I said before you know the 7.25 radius. You, you, there's almost no amount of fret leveling that will allow you to bend notes on an ultra low action. It just doesn't work. Um, but, but you know, anything else, uh, if you do the fret leveling, you can get the bends out of it. First, but not a cigar yet. So it's still, still needing a tiny bit. We're getting there. Very, they were snug from the outset. Um, so I've just, I've basically, I've just added some lacquer on this heel bit here. Um, I'm just going to do what I can to just gently reduce that down to the right fit. Bit 
bits away. We should be almost there. I mean, there we are. getting very nearly there. So which bit's still gripping? have the muscle to do it and I don't want to press on this either so we are still just off, off the mark as it comes towards this top top bit. Yeah look at that so snug very nice I'm just gonna add a little bit of tiny bit of help the inside edge yeah so yeah that's the thing you know playing action is very subjective and I guess you know people who um, people learn to, to play with a higher action totally get it and, and anything else feels odd and I suppose a lot of the time you could say I'm, I'm making an action for perhaps beginner players or even players returning to playing after a long time. Um, okay. We're on track now. Front and back. line up okay this needs actually needs a tiny tap down into here to just pull into place but I don't really want to do it um, I've got my thingy there it depends on how much you can actually do this it may well just pull in I don't certainly don't want to tap the headstock to achieve this um, it's just a, a fraction back and I think probably just due to it catching just a tiny bit on the front edge of there. So I'm going to just help that bit along. Right, I'm going to, this is boring. I'll come back when I put it on and what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to... I'll put two strings on and we'll come back when I'm testing the height of the... what's it? Height of the um, saddle. Back in a minute. Yeah, well, there I am. I, back a bit earlier. I just forgot that I got to do a nut, but there we are. I've just done a nut, mate. Um, now, this looks, at first glimpse, looks like it's going to work. But I won't know until I've got some sacrificial strings on. What I've got here is the what's it, the peggy things. Ooh, and a, and a nut, the original nut. Okay. Ooh, don't like the look of that. And I've got precisely... <laughs> Precisely four. Right. Okay. Precisely four. Thing is. Okay, dokey. <laughs> um, Jim, I don't know if that was the plan, but anyway. I, 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 I. Yeah. Luckily, I have some spare. They've got little white what's it's on them, but hey, it's better than none at all. They all got white? Yeah, they all got white on them. Right, we're going white from now on. That's all we got. Kind of strange. Well, there's luck. Definitely not missing them, am I? No. Did they fall out into the pocket? Nope, there appears. There only appears. There's a driving license here for this guitar. Appears to be only them. Now, yeah, I don't like the look of that. I'd, I've never been a fan of those things sorry but they're um they're grotty now we we have our saddle which is quite tight fit as well so I'm gonna be needing my careful persuader to bring it in and out so what I want first of all is I want a couple of strings just to before I glue this nut down do anything I want to just get a couple of strings on here of some description I don't mind where they come from there could be airs which sort of live somewhere I have a bunch of spares somewhere floating about uh, hopefully I'll find them maybe I can't had some spares uh, if not I can use some from up here but uh, I've got a 
a mood of, well they're not exactly the right gauge but I've got a couple of spares from this here baggie just trillions of darn things they're all top E's mainly nice freebies that you get with your rotor sound so that when people let me break them we've always got we've always got a spare one to go to anyway this is um, this will do for now it's just it's sort of in it's just to check it in principle and make sure everything's kind of all right so this thing I don't know how if this is actually sitting all the way in it's just, it's just yeah it is it's quite high up okay so to, to get this going I do need to do something called putting the tuners back on that really helps oh do you know what <laughs> no, I forgot to do I forgot to put the damn T trust me I forgot to put the shim in that's why it, it was harder to get in than I thought well, not harder to get in it went further in than I thought duh it's just for the um, otherwise it wouldn't get the angle right without it which would be pretty pretty stupid all over the place Morning. Right, we are back in the world of um, Taylor. So um, you can see the repair is set, neck is back on, screws going in, new nut chosen, strings, guide strings. Found only four of the original, couldn't find any more of the original uh, string pegs, so I'm going to have to use some new ones, which luckily I had, um, which are black with white tips so just, just getting these screws nicely in pull the, everything into place again look at the geometry it looks good nothing sticking up everything's good right um, now we've got tuners to put on so I'm going to get cloth and just get tuners a, a sort of rub down as I put them back on um, just really they won't, they won't be sort of brand new but they're not in bad condition. Just, oops. Now I don't know if this is the case on mine. I can't remember. I guess it must be. They've got locator holes here. I don't remember that on mine. So weird. But I guess they must be like that because it's this. No, I've got screws on mine. I'm sure of it. Absolutely positive. Am I? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Anyway. So I'm just going to put these back on, which is, makes it a lot easier. It's a good design. Gonna put these on, and then we're going to stick the nut on. And for now, I'm just going to. What am I going to do? I'm going to put on two strings just to gauge the the overall height of the uh, the saddle, the bridge saddle action. See what kind of adjustments we've made. Now, obviously, the nut isn't going to be correct just now because it's going to be way too tall or a bit too tall but we'll come back to that now let's get this one in the right way I feel like I've had a weekend off I don't know what I'm doing yeah it's, it's difficult I tried to clean off that all that paint stuff and it's very difficult to remove most of it off but it you can sort of see it gets into the grain a little bit so, short of sanding the whole thing absolutely smooth but, um, not a lot we can do with it still I mean sort of, it's, it's better looking from afar Clear this because it's clear lacquer, you can still see remnants of it. It's clear matte lacquer, I should say. Yeah. These are a bit fairly old, they've been around. This guitar has been on the beach, it's lived. Um, anyway, there's my perfection, perfectionism bugging me. No, I want to scrape out. I want to get a little, tiny little surgeon's filament and 
poke out every single one of those bits of leftover house paint. This usually has paint where somebody bangs it against bangs it against a, uh, a wall or something, or it falls against a, you know, the living room wall, and it, it just digs itself into the. The paint is soft and it comes off, and then it goes into the grain of the guitar. I've seen so many finishes with that paint smear. It's incredible how it. I guess it's gloss usually, I think, anyway. And it, maybe it's just something about gloss that it never never actually sets or something, I don't know. But um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's forever to be found. Okay, so we've got the nut is in place. It's the right, exactly tailored to the right thickness. So I'm going to use a couple of these strings just to give me a, an idea of what we're looking at. I'm going to use these new retainer thingies. Try and get the string sit as high up as it can, or with these it's not going to let me do it. So it's down and it's staying down, which we'll see. So we'll go with it two E's just for now, just to gauge the uh, state of the, uh, the saddle. I'm not worried about tuning it properly. Okay, this, this is slightly concave. Let's put some on. Now that's interesting. The geometry feels a bit different or looks different from. Um, well, no, it doesn't look different. How do I know it looks different? I didn't <laughs> didn't have it strung up before, did I? Do oh. so. I don't know what the geometry was doing. That's a good point. Um, here's me kind of thinking. Oh, it doesn't play. Why not? Well. We don't know why not. That's, that's the reason. So let's have a look, see what we can discover. Okay. So according to this, right? We first of all we've got a concave neck. So this is going to sorry convex neck. So this is going to need some adjustment. Um, and I'm going to use. I think this is the one. It may not be the one. Let's see if it is the one. If, um, if anything, what I might do is take the neck off again. So this is a bit roundabout. So not having received this with the neck on, no, no idea about how it would play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this off. Take that down. Take the neck off, and I'm going to adjust the truss rod back into at least a flat position. It's not an easy one to get to and it's a it's a sort of socket ended thing. Beautifully done. I th I'm not even sure if that's the same one. Mine, um, let's just make sure these are right out. Stay there for a minute. Yeah, it's a sort of standard sockety sockety thing. This will be too big, won't it? Yep. Uh, stay there while I look for the appropriate thing. Now, this could take this could take me a while because it's somewhere and I've hung it up somewhere and now I don't know where it is. Uh, it was attached to a magnet, but now it isn't. Right, excuse me while I go and kiss the sky. Uh, is this it? Oh, it might be. Oh, hang on, it might be here. <laughs> I knew it, put it somewhere. Yeah, oh, no, this is kind of. In the right direction, but it's not the one. Billy Jean is not my son. Is that a it's not even a song, is it? Somewhere. Over the rainbow. Is that the one that turns it? I'm going to go and look for the right little sockety thing back in a minute. Okie dokie, here I am. Back with. The baby Taylor new nut joint fixed um, tunes back on a body resprayed neck slightly resprayed um, something rattling in there a little bit of 
usual dust. Come on, you can. Yay! So, um, I've also taken, measured up and taken the what's it down a little bit. You know the thing I'm talking about. Saddle. And I've calculated to give it a nice low action. Now if it's too low, I can always go a tiny bit back upwards with a very small shim. So I'm trying to get these to sit the way they need to sit so they don't pop up. Now we're going to have to do uh, a tiny bit of adjustment on these for, on the first fret of this. And possibly also the, what do I call it? <laughs> that thing. Trust rod. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a bit fra frazzled for the long weekend and I can't think straight. So yeah, the uh, truss rod. And I've set it uh, <coughs> flat at the moment. It was it was con vex, which it shouldn't have been. Um, but anyway, this is a light gauge. It's going to be a light gauge of strings. So, or is a light gauge of strings. So I'm gonna see what happens first. And if I need to do an adjustment, then I'll do an adjustment afterwards um, and I should be able to get in there with my little adjuster thing. I don't have an angled one so I use a screwdriver even. So. Anyway, so we have a nice low action on this, just over two millimeters at the last fret, which for a youngster learning on will be absolutely fine, superb in fact. And along with a fairly light gauge of strings, the aim is to make this very usable. And I'm going to uh, have a quick look here. Let's just, take, let's just measure and see what we've got. I think like about two and a half mils. I always go uh, on the uh, cautious side. That's just a fraction over two, so that when that's tightened up that should be fine. Um, let me just take off this extra miles of stuff. Now of course I haven't put any major pressure on the neck yet. Um, it's only light, light pressure. Um, so we'll see. It should all be good. If it isn't, then I don't really see any other way of doing it. There's no reason why it shouldn't hold because that's how it holds in the first place and there's nothing damaged about the joint. So it shouldn't, um, it shouldn't come undone. I think it's designed pretty well to sort of sit snug under pressure, under load, which is which is a good design. Hence why, uh, even though it was run out of glue, it was probably still playable at some point. Which uh, would be a mighty funny that somebody would have just kind of slid it off once the strings were off and go, oh, okay. It would have dropped off at retuning point. Possibly wouldn't have noticed it up to that point. So yeah, it's well designed. And it, I think it's been designed to show, channel all the, the forces down down into the um, where we're sitting here. Yeah, channel all the forces down into the um, into the headstock in a kind of longitudinal fashion. Some, I made a pick guard uh, for. Let me just make sure these are tight. Did a pick guard, made a pick guard out of laminate for my um, that trunk castery thing there. Um, and I did two, and I did one with resin, and I did one with uh, tight bond. And the resin, uh, resin one dried much quicker and much firmer. Um, although the, the type one one is, is still gluing, so kind of hoping it will still do. But some of those dark African hardwoods are potentially contain too much natural oil, so that they don't make ideal. They're not ideal partners for a wood-based glue like type one. Um, indeed, the bulk of that body, that hardwood body, I, I did with Gorilla Glue, so I could have. Could have done some of that. I think I've got some 
somewhere. I don't know where it went now. I think I might have used it all up on the body actually. Anyway. I'm a bit of a bit of a loose end today, mentally. I'm not all there. Anyway. Getting, uh, get back into the swing of things. So these aren't the original Taylor pegs because there's only four of them, which would be okay if it was a ukulele or something, but it's not. So it needs all six. bit of nut adjustment to do I think in a minute. Get the nice low first fret action. So the thing about an acoustic guitar is first of all you, you can usually make a substantial improvement to the playing action down at the saddle, usually, unless it's all used up already and the kind of guitar is on its last legs, but you can usually make a substantial action reduction um, by taking down some of the height of the saddle. Um, with these guitars you can also put a shim in there or if you wanted to change the shim that's in there for another one. Um, a bit more complicated to do and measure up. So there's the string popping up through. Okay, so just for now just looking at everything, everything in its place. Um, that's higher action than I would like, but I'm not going to overdo it, overcook it for someone else's guitar. Um, let's just see what it is. Well, do you know what? That's coming in at three. That's still a bit too high, so I may pull this and... Sorry, it's, it's just over... It's 2.5, actually. That's that's okay. And down here it's two. Two and 2.5, which is sort of what, what I wanted. Um, as a start point, I often go a little bit further down from that, but um, I'm sort of conscious that not everybody's idea of uh, a low action or acoustic tallies exactly with mine. So, but it, that is a bit higher than I would want, and I am known for a low action. So I'll, I'll, I'll let it. My first point here really is just let's get it tuned up and let's see how it responds to the fix on the neck. So I'm looking at the neck fix and the uh, relief. Uh, light gauge strings sounding very tinkly um, so at the moment everything's looking good neck fix solid lacquer all in place now what I'm looking at I'm going to look at with this uh, capo and pressing down string on the last fret I'm just going to see what the curvature of the neck's doing and it has some relief not a huge amount the interesting part is I can't really slack any more off this truss rod. I can't remember whether these go in two directions. I think it just gets loose and that's your lot. But I could be wrong. Um, so looking at the first fret action, it's quite low, but it's not low enough. So I'm going to I'm going to do a couple of things. Think of a couple of things here. First of all, this action is lower than I want, uh, higher than I want. Um, so we could reduce that action a little bit as a first thing. I want to do it without taking the strings off and off, off and off, off and on too many times. 
and then we want, want to make just some small adjustments down here. It's actually not miles off here, but it's higher than I'd want, and this one's not even sit, sitting in the slot, which doesn't help. Um, so a bit more tweaking to do, but um, and I'll just leave it for a minute because I just want to go inside and get something. But as it stands, I'm kind of happy that that's fixed. So we'll come back to the final tweaks, which will involve a tiny bit of reduction down there um, and setting the first fret slots or the first fret action low and light so that it's fun to play and it doesn't run into any intonation problems. Okay, so to do that, I'll obviously need to um, slacken this off. But I'll do, a, I'll do a little bit of measuring first and foremost, just to make sure I know how much I'm going to take off. Very light string, so not much of a curve. Freshened up as well. I mean, not perfect, but freshened up compared to what it was. Um, so, okay, do a measurement. Let's do a very. Care I'll do my zoomed glasses just to get sure on this. I mean, I like a two millimeter, but some people get a little bit freaked out. But what we've got here at this point in time is we are, we are close to three, so it could do with half a millimeter gone from there. And we are on sort of just on 2.5, so it's just under 3, just under 2.5, so just short of 3, and just short of 2.5, the other way around. So what I would want to do is if I want to take that down 2.5, I have to lose 0.75 millimeter off the base end. So minus 0.75 off the base end. And uh, if I want to take 2.5 down to 2, I have to take 0.5. 5 off the treble end. So it's a straight line all the way across in this case for the next adjustment. And that will still be conservative compared to how I like it. It'll be a bit more, a bit higher than I would personally have it. So I'm just going to slap these off. They give me access to the saddle. I'll go in a minute and do stuff. But then it will be a case of getting the uh, first fret right, uh, first fret action right. And that's done with saddle slot adjustment. And then if we need to, if there's any sort of excess material above the, the, the bottom part of the slot that we cut, then uh, if necessary, we can um, take it off with the Dremel. Um, this is, this is, gets a little bit tricky to do this, um, especially when it's quite a deep saddle like this. So we have to possibly just have to lose one of these out the back here. Just a couple of these to slide, slide it out. I'll do it with the stronger strings because they don't really mind so much to be um, pushed back in. So then I can I'll just I'll sort of wiggle it along a bit with a bit of help as we go. Move things out of the way. I just don't want it all try to avoid all the strings coming un unhinged. It's there, so I'm going to mark up my 0.75 all the way along. My thing is there. So it's very difficult to get exactly a measurement like this. I'm going to go on the clean side that I haven't already cut. No, actually, no, I'm not going to do I'm going to do on this side. So, it, it, 0 0.75, 0 0.72, that's very close. So it's an absolutely minuscule amount. It's almost almost impossible to really, well, not impossible, it's very difficult to measure. And we go from there to the other end, which goes to approximately there. Which is very difficult to draw. And then we'll go and make a straight line 
all the way across there it is a bit of a piece of string affair at the moment uh, it's gone that's gone wandering okay 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 just check it before I do anything else to make sure I'm not a million miles off no that's fine and then I'm gonna use my faithful sanding block and just the aim is to cut this as perpendicular as possible it's not always easy to do so you have to sort of always move with the piece rather than move my hands from side to side and then stop and just see whether you've got a 90 degrees or a flat bottom on the thing on your piece just taking away and then if we see it start to tilt you just kind of lean it back a little bit in the opposite direction and sort of lightly square it up and then take another look and see we've got 90 degrees on both sides and we're still way off the mark and then we just try and keep the 90 degrees if possible um, until we're down to the line that we want to get to nearly there and just, you know, we want to be even so we're not pushing down too far on one end and not the other. So it helps to sort of grip it in the same way at both ends and apply the, the same sort of downward pressure so it's an even force. Otherwise you will get a sort of a wedge developing. Okay, and just a little bit rocking backwards to straighten it up. grip of it there and then as we get very close to the line just making sure that it's perpendicular and that we're sitting on a flat base it's very important especially if you're using a piezo pickup you don't want it on some sort of tilted on its little front edge um, which you can get if you cut it into a wedge shape we just reduce the efficiency of the, the vibration transfer I suppose would just be a way of putting it um, just about there and do one bit more to straighten this up had a very um very strange experience uh, while I was away visiting my son in Cardiff and we went out to get some food at local Morrisons or something and then um, I got a message while I was there on the phone sorry and that sort of thing where you plug the phone in and, or you know click the phone on and have a look and see who's what the message was and uh, it was somebody I didn't know asking to connect and I always get a bit not suspicious but I'm always cautious because I, I, I kind of only like to really connect with people I know or at least you know interact with a lot anyway so I had I didn't recognize his name and I sort of had a look at the message and the message was uh, asking me if he could use, the chap was asking me if he could use a, an interview I did with somebody for a tribute page to that person. And uh, of course it's one of those things where I didn't even know the guy was dead. Um, I didn't know him particularly well, I just, it was a, it was a famous, well-known glider pilot who was based down in the southwest and I, I was making a podcast about gliding at the time and I'd, uh, I'd kind of bumped into him at the airfield on a sunny <laughs> summer's day and uh, I was recording bits and pieces for the podcast and uh, just sort of grabbed him for an interview and we talked about some stuff I'd read about his adventures and one of the things that I knew about him is that he'd flown, um, done some amazing flying over the cliffs at Sidmouth and, it, uh, and he, he explained to me that it was very rare that you could do that because the wind conditions had to be blowing on shore from the south in order to do it, so up the cliff to create some lift and uh, very rare and they just once in a while they'd scooted down from North Devon when the conditions were right and then gone uh, gliding on the cliffs but it was absolutely spectacular and the film was just wonderful, the, you know, the GoPro stuff. Anyway, and he was an was a interesting guy, a South African guy named Matt Wright and he was uh, he was also a, well, he was an airline pilot and did gliding in his spare time. But had a very 
well-known, well-respected channel. Um, and I discovered in replying to this chap who wanted to use a piece of the, the audio that I recorded, um, you know, discovered that he'd uh, died not only well, it was about a year ago now, coming up to a year ago, but he died at, right here, a mile from me, at the glider club where I'd been flying. And they couldn't find any more information. The, the, the air accident investigation still. Uh, still doing an investigation on it. That's my dad. Oh, I can't talk twice in one, <laughs> one morning. Third action. I'm not answering that because I'm in the mood for stopping at the moment. So we're down to a nice, just over two, two to two, two point two five millimeters at the low E, and about one point seven five, one point five, one point six seven on the high E, and that's absolutely cool by me. Yeah, I get the hint, pops. I'm not available just this minute. Some people watching my videos give me a hard time when I don't answer the phone to my dad and I have to explain that he does call me all the time and since he had a stroke 10 plus years ago with some considerable brain damage it really is, it all depends it all sort of works around what he wants so he'll call again Typically, call again and again and again and again. Which, when you consider that Skype comes to the front of it, pretty much everything you're doing can be really inconvenient, and and it can lead to harsh words. Okay, now I've got, I've just tucked away the strings, uh, the packet that the strings were in. And if I dig it back out, a bit of luck, I can then use it to choose myself uh, a gauge a set of what's it, uh, nut files, just so I can get the first fret action spot on on this thing. So uh, in this one we've got 10, 14, 23, so I'm going to go 13, 17, so there's my 17, 13, 17, 13, 17, 13, 17, 23, I'm going to go 20, is there a 20? 28. I'll go 28. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, what a shame. This guy, Matt, um, you know, he was a, there's a 26 because of it. He was a, he was a, an interesting guy. He was quite taciturn, um, but he was well, well liked and respected in the gliding thing. And he was, uh, we talked in the, in the interview that I did, we, we talked about a, a, an infamous crash or not crash, landing that he'd uh, made in the sea. So I'm uh, looking for 26, I'll do. I'm looking for 30, so I'm looking for 36. Yeah, he'd had to, he'd, he'd come down to do one of his runs down to, it wasn't in Sidmouth, but he'd come down to do one of those, uh, one of those runs down by the coast and he'd gone out over the water and then basically, eventually slightly miscalculated the lift and so on and run out of uh, lift or run out of height and uh, couldn't get back, so he had to, he had found himself having to land in the sea uh, and his beloved glider sank without a trace and he had to be rescued by the um, by the Coast Guard, which is not kind of what you expect when you set out on a day's gliding. But, you know, it was a legendary story and, uh, you know, the fact that he got back safe and, and sound is the important bit. OK, 48, we're going 47, so that's going to be a little bit over tight, but we'll, we'll use a... Uh, some sandpaper to widen that. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, how, how strange to find out somebody had died. Of course, I'd not really been in the gliding thing for some time, so there's no reason I would know. Um, but a shame, you know, well, well respected, very well respected glider pilot. So, anyway, that uh, the guy who contacted me has taken the interview I did um, and put it up on a tribute page along with a load of other 
stuff to uh, remember him by. Yeah, weird to find out that. Okay, so that aside, last little bit on this. Now I'm going to be as gentle as I can with these strings, and because they're brand new, and I want to keep them as new and well conditioned as possible. So I'm just going to gently work this bone down to the amount of the heights I've got here. It's pretty close actually, so we won't be doing this for long, which is great. Um, this was a, a bone nut that I tried to use on something else and got wrong, but it's big enough. It left enough of the nut to do this one with, so it's a good a good reuse of something. Um, this injury here came from breaking one of these <laughs> nut files. Uh, when you've used them for a long time, they can get a little bit of a buckle right at the end which makes it a bit harder to use them um, and then what I discovered is you can break them off uh, and they snap beautifully cleanly um, so that you can use straight from the break and obviously free of any buckling uh, but I it also took off a chunk of my skin on my finger while I did it as it happened so this I might do it with this uh, file in the not too distant future. Right down on the mark, I like that. So point three is the this sort of conservative there you go, there's the one I snapped off. It is a conservative figure that I like to work to. Um, the reality of the, this is that it will work with as little as 0.1 of a millimeter above the first fret. That doesn't give you, it doesn't give your strings a lot of room to spin uh, over that first fret. So it's probably too close to the mark. 0.1 is typically what you might get when you're playing with a capo with a with a guitar that happens to have a low action at the, knot, um, at the bridge. Obviously, if the action's a foot high at that end, the first fret action is always going to be higher as a result at this end because of the nature of the angle but um, by and large on an average reasonably well set up guitar a capo on a low string down here will give you a very low first fret action immediately after the capo um, and it, it can be as little as 1 to 1.1 sorry 0.1 to 0.15 of a millimeter um, now I could, when I started doing this, I could have aimed for that ultra low action, but actually it was a bit too, a bit too far. Um, so I went conservatively up, up above that to around about 0.3 down to 0.2 at the at the sort of lowest, um, and that would that I found gave me a very nice light action. But as, as important was the fact that it uh, it also prevented any uh, first fret, low fret intonation issue. Jesus, I hate doing that! Can I tell you I hate spiking myself on those little off cuts? Well, I sure as heck do. I sure as heck if I do. Phil, Phil Connors. Was undercut the first one. I'm going to go back. Wimp out too early. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. So I went, I went conservative. I'll do a tiny bit with this just to make sure the slot stays open. Yeah. So I went. Yeah, my, I think my first cut was 0. Point, or the first time I did it. First time I did it, I went to 0. Point, three of a millimetre and it played so well after that um, that I kind of went for that ever after and it seemed to be a pretty good action whether it was that was good whether it was uh, an acoustic guitar or an electric um, See the uh, 
the air gap under there. It's very, it's very easy to track with your eyes. You can, you can see quite well when there's a gap. As a, you can see, you can judge the reflection really. Yeah, still, there's a, still a gap under there, but it's not that much. Call it, call it good for now. Let's look at it again in a second. Yeah, so it's a uh, point three was my start point, and like like I say, it's not always possible to get it absolutely exact. With bone, it usually is, in my experience, because so it's a dependable material. But with some other substances, you can kind of you can find it lurching all over the place occasionally. So, um, but uh, I don't mind if I go. See, that one could do with breaking off as well. I don't mind uh, going sort of between point. Two, five, and four is a sort of nice range that I'm comfortable using. This really is time to bust this off. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this. Is it bendy enough? It's a little bendy, but I'm gonna get rid of this very end bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just make sure I use something. This is this is a kind of in lieu of. Buying new ones. There you go. Sounds drastic, but uh, gives me gives me a kind of fresh start on this. Yeah, lovely. And I mean, you know, in line for a new set at some point anyway. And low. I mean, this is this is actually still higher than often I would go. I mean, I'm on 0.3 on this one now. Providing you see fresh air and you can uh, you can hear it ring, you're not down at the mark yet. So we've got room for a bit more cutting. Um, like I say, bone is my choice of or nut of choice, just because it's cuts nice. Dependable. That's the same thing pretty much every time, so I don't, I don't fear using it as a nut. Um, other substances it range range from okay to horrible. Um, and the typical example of some of the plastic nuts you get on Chinese copies are just vile, and they um, they uh, they go mushy when you try and cut them so you can cut them but you don't you can't get any feedback as to what's happening and then uh, when you cut them you, they sort of close up around the slot in fact they close up around the, the uh, file um, which makes it kind of hard to use I'll stop there with that one um, yeah so they, it makes it difficult to cut and then actually very spongy once you've uh, cut them and you try and match it up with the you know, put the strings in the slots and they, they don't behave they kind of pull right down and get wedged in the gap at the bottom ow so I could do I could do with breaking that one off as well they're all a bit tired these I've had them for three or four three years four years now They've done great service Um, eventually it comes a time to buy one new set and when I do I'll buy an oversized set because there's absolutely no half of these I don't use because they're too they're too small there's no point buying a nine a nine gauge set you'll never you'll never use them because a nine gauge always chokes the strings because you can it's due to the nature I've drawn this out on other videos but it's due to the nature of the cut you, you can almost never cut a mathematically precise slot and if you don't any curvature even the slightest curvature removes any required or the required clearance you need for the string to move or not and or not get stuck so when you use a, a nine gauge for a nine a nine gauge file for a nine gauge string you're starting off with no clearance or no tolerance for um, bend 
taking away your, your gap, you know, the remaining freedom of movement. So nine on nine, you'll be stuck from the beginning. Ten, a ten file on nine, still. Still has no leeway. So I tend to go quite a bit over and it works. You have to go a long way over before you uh, end up with a string that rolls around at the, at the nut and stops making a good noise. It's, 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 uh, and you know that because most guitars are mass produced and sent out of the shop <laughs> kind of geared up to take anything from a nine string or an eight string right up to a 11 or more, you know, um, if it's an electric. So they, they obviously don't, they don't really start out by limiting themselves. <laughs> They start out with a you know a kind of catch-all gauge, and of course if you can do, do that, then they're going to play great from the from the outset. You, you're, you're clearly not going to be in a, a zone where the, the slot's so big the string jumps around and vibrates itself to death. So, on that kind of logic, I would say always go high. When they go low, go high, and then you'll you'll have a nice. Um, Free moving strings, because to be honest, that, as I've said in every video I've made, the degree to which the nut slots allow free movement of the strings and or choke them off and cause you tuning problems is the degree to which you'll enjoy the guitar. And so this is kind of probably almost the most important of all operations, second only to mark second only to ringing the uh, slack out of the strings right okay last one thirteen for a ten can I just push it to one side there I can I can Now this, when you think about this, the absolute minuteness of these slots, it's kind of hard to imagine that how anything plays at all. And I, I do like to just help it along with a bit of a widening V file, because that notch just creates a bit of space, if nothing else, for the, uh, for the file to do its next bit of cutting. Um, but it, it also doesn't hurt to stop the string getting caught as well. And uh, in my ebook, uh, I, I show how to do this whole thing with just, pretty much just the um, the jeweler's file, this one here. Um, you know, people have a, a, a version to imagining setting your first fret action with a, with a V file. And actually with a carefully used V file, and as long as you make sure to just round out the bottom of it a little bit, uh, the slot, you can cheaply and accurately cut all of your nut slots um, and one file will do for all of your strings as well instead of this ridiculously expensive lark of <laughs> buying, <sighs> buying a whole set, a different one for every string and then a different, ga a different set for every gauge of strings and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, woohoo! So now I'm in, I'm in I've set my first fret action territory. I'm just going to stretch out the last little bits of uh, thingy. Take a note off here. As I'm doing this, I'm listening for any pings at the nut. If I hear any, it means I need to widen, uh, widen the slot.
and dust everywhere, but... Okay, everything is looking, holding up good. Well, um, first fret action, looking good. Light, very easy to play. Still needs stretching, which I haven't done. bridge here. Tiny little bit of lifting going on in the corner. It's not too bad. But yeah. Okay, so just blowing some dust away. There we have it. Taylor Baby, I won't uh, spend any more time on this just now. I'm gonna, I will put indoors, I'll put a little bit of graphite on the inside uh, and the slots, but they're all running free without pinging, so that's great. Action's where I want it. Set up, resprayed, a little bit freshened up from what it was, and uh, yeah, intact in one piece. So that's good. Hey, see you again.